Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the latest uh, installation in ARB's Chairman Seminar uh, Series. Uh, today's presentation is on the Orbital Scythe Electric Mower Prototype Development and Testing. This project was conducted as a, under a grant from the uh, Air Board's Innovative Clean Air Technologies Program. Our speaker today is Craig Witte. He's president of Osage Power Equipment, uh, formerly vice president of strategic marketing with Tetra Pak Group, a $9 billion Swedish multinational. Um, Mr. Witte is responsible for commercial management and new product development in the company's second largest business unit and for marketing packaging material and filling machines in 72 countries. Mr. Witte is, has five U.S. patents, two in motion picture imaging, two in packaging, most recently one in the field of outdoor mower equipment, power equipment, which is what he's here to talk to us about today. Craig? Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the uh, Air Resources Board for funding this project and also giving us the opportunity to come and present results uh, from this product development project we've been working on for the last couple of years to develop an energy efficient lawnmower. I'd also like to thank Steve Church uh, for his careful and good natured oversight of this project. It's been a pleasure working with you, Steve. The intent of this presentation is to first look at the current technology for cutting grass, at some of the drawbacks of this technology, and then in more detail at the development of the concept for an alternative that we've been working on. And finally, the testing results that we've been able to gather in the last year or so uh, using these prototypes. And at this point, I'll just mention, I'm happy to take questions or comments at any time. We don't have to wait until the end if uh, you, you feel like there's something that you'd like me to address immediately. I won't belabor this point. It's, it's widely uh, recognized that gas-powered rotary mowers are not environmentally friendly. Uh, one comparison often cited is that running a gas-powered mower for one hour What's the equivalent of uh, pollution in the air of driving a new car for about 350 miles? Adding catalytic converters, which is the uh, current approach that the indus industry seems to be taking to reduce emissions, doesn't do anything to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that are created. But in addition to, to these issues, I'd like to suggest another question that I think goes deeper into what drove us to start thinking about whether or not there's a, an alternative. And that is, do you really need this much energy to cut grass? Because grass, after all, is ra rather fragile stuff. It's, uh, it's pretty easy to, I mean, there's, I saw something in the New York Times, I think, or maybe it was on the internet, but somebody actually cutting the grass with the scissors, a retired guy. So um, it doesn't take a lot of energy, and it certainly doesn't take as much energy as you can get from two horses, which is, would be considered small by current standards for a gas-powered mower. Uh, and, and the trend in recent years has been towards larger and larger mowers, so it's not uh, uh, out of the ordinary to find uh, a mower that's as large as six and a half horsepower. So the question becomes, um, is, there, is there really a need for this much power? And with the current technology, there really is. Because in order to cut grass with a swinging blade, you have to get that blade swinging very quickly. It's cutting the grass with purely inertial force. It's not cutting it like a scissors. It's hitting the grass blade as it's standing there in the, on the ground, and it's severing it only because it's moving so quickly. So at scale, it would be like trying to cut bamboo with a baseball bat. It can be done, but it takes a lot of power. And that explains to some extent why rotary electric mowers tend to be smaller than gas-powered mowers. Uh, the diameter of the blades is sometimes 12 or 14 inches because the power requirements scale up at the square of the blade width. So, uh, and the largest capacity electric rotary mowers are only about a horsepower. 
There's another big issue with rotary mowers and the amount of power that they use, and that is the safety factors. I don't, this is from an episode earlier this season of Mad Men where somebody got, somebody in an advertising agency got his foot cut off with a lawnmower. Uh, I thought it would be preferable to show something that was had some artistic uh, representation rather than f factual uh, photographs because some of these accidents are really tragic. There are 65 to 75,000 lawnmower accidents in the U.S. every year, uh, and about 9,000 of those involve children. So the the safety factor when you're using two to six horsepower to cut grass you're going to have, uh, and you're basically doing it in a chamber that's open on one side, the side that's pointing down. But when accidents happen, they tend to be serious and sometimes tragic. The approach of cutting grass with a high-speed blade also is not necessarily the best thing for the grass. If the blade isn't sharp, uh, you can get a rather ragged cut. Uh, grass that's cut in, and doesn't have a clean cut loses moisture more quickly, needs to be watered more often, takes longer to recover, and generally doesn't give you the best looking lawn. There has been a, uh, an alternative. Actually, the first lawnmower ever uh, invented was a real type lawnmower. And they are much more energy efficient because uh, they cut the grass between two pieces of metal, like a scissors. One drawback with uh, real mowers is that they require a precision setup and maintenance. The gap between the turning reel that gathers the grass and brings it into the fixed blade at the bottom of the mower has to be kept at a precise gap. Uh, if, it's, if it's too close, if they touch, it will bind. And if, it's, if the gap is too big, uh, you won't cut the grass. The other drawback of a real mower is that they can't mulch the grass. They can't cut it up into little pieces. And once the grass is brought against the blade at the bottom, it's cut once and it just lies there on the ground. Uh, another reason for the, the big power requirements of uh, gas-powered rotary mowers, the mulching mowers, is that it takes a substantial amount of energy to recut the grass clippings that are in the housing uh, surrounding the blade. Uh, because again, uh, those grass clippings are already flying around in the air. They're not attached to anything. So uh, in order to cut them in when they're suspended in the air like that, it again requires a huge amount of energy to cut them with purely inertial force. There have been ideas uh, in the past to recut clippings in a real mower. These were basically ideas for passive devices to rechannel the clippings back down into the cutting head. But because they were passive, they tended to clog up and none of these uh, ideas ever worked in any commercially viable way. So that brought us to what might be possible as an alternative. And uh, when we sat down to talk about what kind of objectives we would have for a new energy efficient lawnmower, clearly the quality of the cut is important. It should be as good as a real mower. But it should also mulch the grass. It should cut the grass up into little pieces so that you don't have to either rake it up and then send it to a landfill or put it even in a compost pile because Grass that sits on the ground, moist grass, and that, that clumps together will tend to ferment anaerobic uh, uh, digestion, and that will create methane, and methane is a powerful greenhouse gas. And uh, if you can return, it's it generally called grass, -like, with grass cycling, if you can return the clippings to the lawn, uh, the lawn needs less fertilizer and less watering. Uh, the, the main objective was to create a grass cutting device that would use much less energy than a rotary mower, uh, that would be capable of being battery powered so that you could use it on a larger yard up to, for example, a half acre. Uh, that would have a cutting head as wide or wider uh, as a rotary mower so that 
you don't have to make more trips across the lawn than you would with the current product. Uh, more that would be easy to use. We don't think uh, consumers are going to be very anxious to give up convenience features just to provide uh, some sort of environmental benefit. We think if you can provide a product to them that's as good or as convenient to use as what's currently available, they will switch over if you have a product that's environmentally desirable. Uh, and then safety, addressing the safety issue, a mechanism that would create fewer opportunities for injury. Uh, ideally, this device would uh, be self-sharpening. It would have easily replaceable blades and that the blades could be proprietary. From a business sense, that could be important. Uh, there are plenty of there are plenty of products that uh, kind of have the Gillette approach where they, your, your color printer, for example, they'll basically give you the printer, but they'll keep selling you ink. There's probably an opportunity to do that in the uh, lawnmower field as well, but uh, at this point, lawnmower, rotary lawnmower blades are pretty much a generic item. And finally, the product should be no more expensive than a mid-priced rotary mower. The basic concept that we started working with was the idea that you would have a cylindrical reel with multiple blades, and the multiple blades would counter-rotate inside the reel. So we put a cutting surface on the inside of each of the reel bars, and the grass is cut between the reel bar and the blade, and the blades are flexible. Uh, in the current prototype, the blades are about 21 and a half inches long. They're two inches wide. They're made of spring steel, and the steel is uh, 10 thousandths of an inch thick. So in concept, uh, we were looking for something that works kind of like this. The reel bars rotating in one direction to gather the gr grass into the blades. The blades rotating in the other direction to cut against the inside edge of the reel bars. So the mulching action actually takes place. Uh, the reel bar, which is shown in this diagram in red, makes contact with the top of the blade of grass. Blade comes along, cuts off the top of the grass. Uh, the mower moves forward a little bit. The reel bar moves down. The next blade comes and cuts another piece off. Uh, and that operation is uh, repeated as the mower moves forward, so that the mulching is actually performed while the grass is attached to the ground, not while it's flying around in the air. So we're, we're not recutting the clippings. We're cutting the grass blade itself several times. Uh, the early decisions when we first started to think about a prototype, uh, we just decided that an eight-inch an eight diameter reel would be um, a good place to start. Real mowers, by their nature, uh, have difficulty cutting tall grass. Uh, really tall grass, grass that's higher than the radius of the cutting head, tends to get pushed over. So the bigger the, the uh, real diameter, the more likely you are to capture the taller grass. A cutting width of 21 inches to make it uh, comparable to a rotary, the, the larger rotary mowers. And as I mentioned earlier, we're using a blade material that's spring steel. It's not exotic. It's, uh, it's a commodity item. But it's hardened, tempered spring steel. The initial format for the cutting head was seven evenly spaced reel bars, which gives you a gap of about three inches between each bar. Uh, a concentric rotor with either two or four counter-rotating blades, and we built both types. Uh, the advantage of two blades is fewer parts, uh, but the disadvantage is you have to spin it twice as fast to make the same number of mulching cuts. And because the, in this uh, format, the reel and the rotor were concentric and making contact all, all around the circumference of the reel, uh, we used an odd number of reel bars and an even number of blades so that we didn't have all of the blades making contact with the reel bars at the same time. We tried to spread out the, the force of the cutting. So back in 2004, we built a prototype where the, uh, the reel bars were straight 
and the blades were at an angle and wrapped around a, the central cylinder. And uh, the blades were at a very low angle, so it actually cut with a, kind of a scissors-like pinching motion between the real bar and the blade. What we found was that it actually did a pretty good job of cutting the grass. Uh, it, was, it was effective in cutting and mulching the grass. The problem was that it was very prone to jamming. Anything, anything like a small stick that got in between the real bar and the tip of the blade tended to pull the blade down into the real bar and create a jam. And because the blades were helical set up around the cylinder, they had to be clamped along the full length and that made them difficult to change. So in a second implementation, we, we changed and we went to straight blades and helical reel bars. And um, the, <coughs> the difficulty there, the challenge became to get those reel bars with the right curvature and the, the right orientation. But the cutting action was then we, we placed the blades at 90 degrees so that um, the cutting action was more like a wiping action. And that actually eliminated the jamming problems. Uh, we, we didn't have any problems with the blades now being uh, distorted and, and pushed into the real bars. We did, however, uh, have problems with the stress that this approach put on the blades. Uh, and we had uh, to solve a, an issue with blade breakage. So the third implementation, and the one that we're focused on right now, actually has the, the blade at a fairly, it's a moderate negative angle, so that the grass is cut with what I'll call a soft wiping action. We've also changed the mounting of the rotor within the reel so that it's now eccentric. It doesn't, the blades don't make contact with the reel bars around the full circumference of the, rotor, of the reel. Uh, they're offset, the, the rotor is offset by about an eighth of an inch towards the bottom front quadrant of the reel. So it's only in that quadrant where the blades make contact with the reel bars. So that's where the cutting takes place. It reduces the amount of wear between the blades and the reel bars uh, and the, the energy that's needed to overcome the friction between the parts. The uh, going to this system, we, we still don't have a jamming problem and we've uh, now reduced or nearly eliminated the excessive uh, stress on the blades. Because at a low angle like this, the blades really don't need to flex very much to get over any obstacle that would be introduced between the real bars and the blades. We did have additional challenges in uh, trying to realize the practicality of this approach. The, the primary one was the ability to heat treat the real bars, to harden them uh, without them being distorted because they're fairly th thin parts. They have a uh, asymmetric profile. There's a, there's a slot that's milled in them to create the cutting edge. And so when we uh, sent them to a commercial heat treater to heat them and then quench them. What we found is when they went into the quench water or oil, uh, they whatever hit the, the quench in first would contract more than the rest of the part and we ended up with kind of corkscrew type blades. So we, we think we've addressed that. We built a special rig that actually, uh, on the left you can see a close up of it. It's an annular ring. It sprays water around the full circumference of the bar and moves along the length of the bar to quench it. And that seems to have eliminated the warpage problem. So the current design and the one that uh, we'll present some uh, test results on still has an eight inch reel. The reel revolves at about 150 RPM. It's a four blade rotor. It uh, revolves at about three times that speed at 450 RPM, 21 and a half inch blade width. Uh, this model has adjustable blade extensions so that if there's wear on the blade or for any other reason, you, the, the extension of the blade towards the real bar needs to be changed. It's pretty easy to do that. Um, it's just a lever at the end of 
one of the rollers that holds the blades in place. And um, because of the layout of the chassis, uh, we can, and, and we think this would be a commercial advantage, uh, we can provision this mower with anything from something like 7 amp hours of capacity up to about 19 or 20 amp hours of capacity. So uh, instead of pushing around a mower with a full capacity of lead acid batteries, which are pretty heavy, if you only have a small lawn, uh, could easily be set up for uh, much less battery capacity and less weight. But if you want to cut a half acre of lawn, uh, this would have the capacity to do it. This uh, is normal speed video of the mower in operation. This is actually, this was done last year. Uh, and what I want to point out is that you can see that the clippings that are cut by the mower are kicked out in front of the, the mower. And as the mower passes over the ground, it basically the reel bars sweep the clippings back down into the lawn. This is 10 times normal, or one-tenth normal speed. Um, the other thing that I'll point out is this is actually, this was a prototype we did a year ago. We didn't have the uh, curvature of the reel bar, of the reel bars quite right. So that cable around the center is to cinch them in and to tighten them up a little bit so the blades are making the right kind of contact in the center. Uh, this, again, is uh, one-tenth normal speed. But the, the clover flowers kind of give a nice visual tracking for what's being cut in the trajectory of them. So uh, the, the performance testing that was the focus of the ICAT grant, uh, we obviously wanted to test the quality of the cutting. We wanted to test the energy consumption compared to rotary uh, mowers. We wanted to test the mechanical reliability of these prototypes. And we wanted to test the real world commercial viability in terms of the features and the use and so on. The, the cut quality, um, I have to say, we're, we're fairly pleased with the progress, but we don't think that we're there yet. What we find is that where the, there are clumps of grass, thick grass, uh, the mower currently has an issue with cutting all of the grass. Uh, I think we're, we're seeing some issues where the, because of the angle of the cutting edge on the reel bar at the top on the inside surface, the, the grass is kind of wraps around half the reel bar before it meets the edge. So our intent is to move the edge more towards the, le the leading edge of the bar. And uh, we think we can address a large part of the cutting issue uh, with changes like that. What you don't see with the mower, that you do see very often with uh, rotary mowers, is a clumping of, of grass when you're doing a heavy cut. Uh, you won't see any trail of uh, these clippings to one side of the mower because of this action of the clippings being kicked out in front of the mower. And even with a heavy cut, um, it's it doesn't leave any uh, mulch or clippings on the surface of the lawn. So again, to, to address the cut quality, we'll go back uh, and re-examine some of the parameters like the real diameter and the width, but more in particular, the real bar angle, which is currently at eight degrees. And uh, standard real mowers have an angle of about 20 degrees. So we think there's probably some advantage to increasing the angle. Uh, there's a practical consideration in how do you get the blades in and out of the mower if you do that. But we think we can address that by bringing them in from the side. Uh, the reel bar curvature, the position of the cutting edge on the surface of the reel bar, the blade angle, and the blade length, width, and material are all important. And if we change one, we, we may have to change some or all of the others. And one of the things that we uh, realized as we were in the middle of this project is the physics of cutting is not very well understood. And so we, we approached some 
computer simulation companies and asked if they could uh, model some of this on their computers. And the answer was basically no. Um, the only way to find the answer to some of these questions is to actually try it. The second category that we wanted to address was uh, comparison testing with energy consumption. And we did two tests. Uh, we did a small area with a heavy cut that took about 20 minutes to, to run both mowers. And we did a larger area with a lighter cut, uh, but the, the testing took about 60 minutes, a little more. Uh, and what we did was that we compared the Osage mower that's 21 and a half inches wide with a new Black & Decker rotary mower with a 19-inch blade. Both mowers had 24-volt motors. Uh, the, the battery capacity on the Osage mower was 19 amp hours. It was 17 amp hours on the Black & Decker. Uh, but the, the difference in the width, 21 and 19 inches, is in almost exactly the same ratio as the, the difference in the battery capacity. So we, we had a little more battery capacity on the wider mower. We think that was a pretty fair comparison. They had identical battery charging units and identical power meters installed. In the first test, uh, the cutting height was set at 1 and 3 eighths inches, and the starting grass height was moderate. And the starting voltage on the meters was, was very close. The Black & Decker was actually very slightly higher, but for all practical purposes, they were the same voltage. The, uh, the plot that was cut, we did the first loop back and forth with the Black & Decker, then the Osage, then the Black & Decker, then the Osage for the same number overall. The total distance traveled was 1,050 feet. And at the end of that uh, test, the Black & Decker had used 2.234 amp hours of energy and the Osage had used 1.392 which is a difference of 38%. So 38% less use by the Osage mower. Is your rate of actual progress keep a constant? And if you try different rates of progress, the, OK, the question was, uh, was the rate of progress of both mowers, the rate at which they were pushed, uh, constant? Or did we try to keep them constant? Or was uh, they were? It was normal walking speed. It's a good question. And the second test we did, we addressed that. In this test, uh, I would have to say I was the operator, so I I made an effort to walk at the same speed. But there it, there was no control for the speed that we pushed the mowers. But the mowers covered essentially the same amount of territory. Uh, this, so we alternated um, uh, one lap back and forth in each direction. This is a photograph of a close-up of the grass after the cutting and of a wider view that shows the overlapped uh, or the alternating paths. And it, it's, uh, it's, I think it's fairly difficult to see which was cut by which more. The second test, uh, which was uh, a, a larger scale test, the cutting height was set at two inches rather than one and three eighths. Uh, it was done in basically uh, what we call in the Chicago area forest reserve. It was a big open grove uh, about the size of a football field. And the grass height was uh, variable. Some was short, some was fairly long. And in this case, we did uh, push the mowers at exactly the same rate. We pushed them uh, basically in lock, lockstep. So we'd start at one end, go 350 feet, come back and count one, two, three to start. And when we got to the end of the path, one, two, three, and we stopped and then turned around and came back. And we didn't overlap the paths at all. We didn't uh, want to uh, take the chance that one mower would maybe overlap an already cut uh, lane more than the other. So we just 
<laughs> the, the area didn't look that manicured at the end, but we had separate lanes that were distinct. And we, uh, we did 12 laps, so 350 feet down, 350 feet back in lockstep for a total of uh, 8,400 feet, which is like a mile and a half. And at the end of, well, and, and we, we recorded the meter readings, the energy consumption, at the end of each lap. So uh, at the first lap, second lap, third lap, we recorded both the amp hours used and the voltage readings on, them, on the both mowers. What we found was that at the beginning, uh, there was, after the first lap, there was, again, almost 38% uh, difference uh, savings in terms of the orbital mower compared to the rotary electric. Uh, by the 12th lap, that difference had shrunk. The, the absolute gap was bigger at 2.32 amp hours, but the percentage was, was a little lower. And uh, we think that's basically because as the voltage of the rotary electric dropped faster, it was pushing less current through the rotary electric mower. Uh, I've been using the rule of thumb that with these, with, uh, with electric mowers that are rated at 24 volts, you should really stop cutting when the voltage, when the mower is turned off, is down around 23 and a half volts. If we, and, and that's actually where the voltage was after the last lap with uh, Black and Decker. If we use that as a cutoff and you extend the, the, uh, the lines in terms of voltage drop, you can see that there would, uh, the, the Osage mower could have cut substantially greater laps and substantially more area. And being a little wider, it was already cutting a little more grass. If you overlay the, the first uh, small scale test with the second test, uh, you get basically, and, and you look at how much you could have cut with a smaller, uh, well, with a, a shorter cut, clearly both mowers are going to be able to cut less lawn. But the uh, proportion of the advantage is about the same between the rotary and the Osage mower. So reliability testing. Uh, two mowers earlier this fall went to the Chicago, Chicago Botanic Garden to be used by their ground maintenance crews. Uh, and uh, that testing, we haven't uh, achieved the total number of hours that we had hoped so far. We'll, we'll pick it up again in the spring. But what we've seen is that there were, uh, there were some uh, failures, some, some breakdowns. We had a solder joint break uh, with the, uh, the socket that the recharger plugs into. We did have a couple of broken blades. Uh, we suspect they, they did hit something hard like a, a sprinkler head. Uh, there was a broken power switch, so two of the problems so far have been with the electrical system. In the mower that had the broken blades, somehow the reel also got twisted, which is, again, suggesting that they probably ran it into something that um, wouldn't move. And then we had the problem with blades slipping out. And we had also sent a third mower here to, to Steve and uh, some of the other people in the office to test. And they had a, a problem uh, after a bit with blades slipping out. And uh, we think we've, we've solved that issue. It had to do more with play and tolerances and being built in a garage than, than the basic design. We finally had one kind of catastrophic issue where one of the reel bars slipped out of the, uh, of the reel, jammed up against a wheel, and that did have a, a bad impact on the drivetrain. But again, it's not something that we would uh, be concerned about in a commercial version where we, we would do uh, additional design changes to ensure that those blades or the real bars couldn't slip out like that. And in the testing that's gone on at the uh, Botanic Garden, 
the mowers, when they're cutting uh, the grass in a fairly light cut, they've, they've run up to two hours. So uh, looking back at our original objectives, uh, the, the cut of the mower, we think we're in the ballpark. It's not uh, quite where we want it to be, but we, we think we know how to improve it and get it where it needs to be. It, it certainly mulches, uh, and the mulch is, is uh, swept down into the lawn so that there's uh, really no reason to ever collect clippings. The amount of energy it uses is a small fraction of what a large gas rotary electric mower would use. And it's, uh, it's, it's a substantial fraction less than the largest electric rotary mower. And yet, we can cover much more uh, lawn area. The, uh, the battery usage, um, because we're, it's a more efficient way of cutting, uh, we think we can uh, get up to a half acre of cut without any problem for an average depth of cut. Uh, the cutting head is as wide as rotary mowers. It is easy to use. It's definitely safer than a rotary mower. If you stuck your finger in the cutting head, you might break a finger, but it wouldn't cut it off. Uh, we're not, we're, with the current setup and, and the dimensions, we don't have a self-sharpening system right now. But with the changes that we uh, plan to make to change the orientation of the cutting edge on the reel bars, we think we will get back to that point. And we, uh, although we don't have a final design and final cost estimates, we again think we're in the ballpark in terms of hitting a price point that's in the same range as a mid-priced rotary mower. Uh, the potential pollution reduction from an approach that would uh, reduce, let's say, the energy used by 25 or 30 percent could be significant. Uh, there have been studies that have looked at the amount of gasoline used by lawnmowers in the U.S., 54 million Americans, and this was from uh, 2001, uh, use something like 800 millions of gasoline per year to cut their lawns. This generates huge amounts of uh, pollutants, uh, including greenhouse gases. The EPA estimates that lawnmowers account for almost 5% of the pollution from all sources, and that the replacement of every 500 gas mowers with non-motorized mowers would uh, spare the air, again, of large amounts of uh, emissions and, and greenhouse gases. And there are 6 million new mowers sold every year. So the scope and potential for replacing gas mowers with electric mowers is is substantial. Uh, I also believe that because of the way that lawnmowers are used, they're used for a short period of time intermittently, once or twice a week during the cutting season, they are prime candidates for using uh, renewable energy. I wouldn't necessarily put uh, a solar panel right on the mower, but you could easily recharge a mower from a solar panel on your garage, for example and eliminate the uh, generation of greenhouse gases or, or other pollutants at the electric generating station. So the bottom line is it's uh, taken us a long time. We've had a lot of issues that have come up. But uh, we've, uh, these, these are some pictures of the, the mower that we sent out here to California. And the crate was damaged. And the mower was damaged, so we didn't get as much opportunity to have it uh, tested here as we'd hoped. But um, we think we've made substantial progress. And the next steps will be to optimize the cutting parameters, as I've been mentioning before, to finalize the reliability testing, to finalize the design of a near commercial version, and to finalize and circulate a business plan sometime early next year. So that's the end of my prepared presentation. I'd be happy to uh, take any questions. Yes. Okay. Uh, were there any other design concepts other than the real concept? We didn't look at any others. Um, 
the, the real concept seemed to be, the idea of cutting grass between two pieces of metal seemed to be the only concept that allowed us to take advantage of a real significant energy savings. Um, a, a weed whacker type approach, a, a, a line that would spin, uh, probably would use substantially less energy than trying to spin a heavy blade at the same speed. But again, you're trying to cut with inertial force. Those weed whacker lines are round, they're not sharpened. And so you wouldn't, you wouldn't intuitively, you wouldn't probably want to go out and cut your whole lawn with a weed whacker, uh, even if you could save some energy. So uh, no, this is the only concept uh, we've, we've looked at and developed. I shouldn't say looked at. I mean, when you start thinking about a project like this, one of the first things you should do is you go back and do a patent search. And you look at what everybody else has thought of and tried. Uh, and there are actually, there are a few other possibilities. There are some lawnmowers that cut like a, a hedge trimmer. Uh, and it is conceivable that you could do something with layers of hedge trimmer blades oscillating back and forth to mulch. But that becomes a fairly heavy mechanism. The fact that you're going in one direction and then changing direction requires more energy. So something that's con con constantly turning in the same direction is probably preferable to something where you're oscillating and those types of things tend to vibrate a lot. Yeah, Craig, we had one uh, well, email come in from our webcast audience. This is from Ed Benelli. He's in the uh, uh, Department of Toxic Substance Control here, Office of Pollution Prevention and Green Technology. He says, I've been using the B&D product for several years. I can attest that there is a need for an improved design. The B&D is only good for small California subdivision style yards. For a larger yard, it would be wholly inadequate. Looking forward to improved designs. So Good. I hope we can provide that. <laughs> I mean, that, is, that really is the limitation of the rotary technology. It requires so much energy that an electric version of it is, is going to run out of, uh, I shouldn't say run out of gas, but run out of juice uh, before you're going to be able to cut any large size lawn. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. I thought that was a great presentation. Thank I was you. wondering if you could speak to uh, your business plan as well. And of course, the bottom line question would be when we can go down to the local Home Depot and buy one. Well, it's interesting that you phrase it that way because our, our concept, we're actually thinking of a small box strategy rather than a big box strategy. Um, we, we, we think that the way to introduce this product may be through your local hardware store to the extent they're still around. Um, but uh, the business, we've, we, we, we have some interest with potential partners. Uh, we have been not really started talking seriously with them yet, but that is our objective for the next six months. We had a short conversation about this over lunch. Uh, if, if things would move ahead uh, with, without too much delay, uh, something like two years for a market introduction probably isn't unrealistic. Your uh, energy uses comparisons between the gasoline rotary, the electric rotary, and the electric reel. Between the gasoline rotary and electric reel is an order of magnitude, but between the electric rotary and the electric reel was only 30 percent or so. Why such a vast difference? Well, I think it's because the largest, uh, the, 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 the gas energy use was calculated based on the horsepower rating of the engine and 746 watts per horsepower, which is the accepted uh, standard for comparing them. Uh, gas-powered engines, especially if they're self-propelled and if they're heavier, they have, they have big engines. And, and uh, the largest electric 
is the is the Black and Decker in terms of capacity, and it's barely one horsepower. Uh, one thing about the electric uh, mowers, if if the load requirement is low, less energy goes to the motor. As the as the difficulty of cutting the grass goes up, more energy goes to the motor. So there's a, on that slide that I showed, there was a range of something like 350 to 700 watts for the rotary electric and 250 to 500 for the Osage. Um, but basically, uh, the gas engine, it's, it's running full speed all the time. And most of that energy, when you're not cutting grass, or if you're cutting, cutting light cuts, it's going out the exhaust pipe. Uh, so the, uh, the magnitude of, of potential for making savings is huge. Uh, but it has to do more with, I think, the way a gas engine is designed and coupled to the blade than, than anything else. And, and the fact that they can make much bigger, more powerful gas engines. I actually had the pleasure of, of testing the one that came out to California, and I, I thought it was very heavy. Mm -hmm. um, are you considering at all using something other than lead-acid batteries for, for the, your lawnmower? Yeah. Uh, there the issue is, primarily the issue is cost, but certainly lithium-ion. If we wanted to build a, a high-end mower, uh, the, the weight of the, most of the weight of the mower is in the batteries probably 40 pounds worth of batteries in, in the mower when it's fully configured. One option that I mentioned earlier was if you're cutting a small lawn, you could take 20 pounds of batteries out and probably still have more than enough uh, using the energy efficient method of cutting to get the job done. But um, the concept from the beginning was that this technology, it's really a cutting head technology. It's not, uh, it was meant to be battery independent. So whether it's uh, lithium ion, now there are other battery technologies that are coming along. There's a lead acid battery technology that uses a graphite sponge type material for the anode and the cathode, which is much lighter weight. So we think that we will benefit from those battery advances going forward, especially in terms of weight. Okay, uh, Craig, we have one more uh, question from uh, uh, D'Artagnan Mims from uh, ARB. He says, thank you, Mr. Witte, for the thought-provoking presentation. As a new homeowner, I am currently in the market for a lawnmower. Any suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> don't get the six and a half horsepower one. <laughs> um, I think it's like everything else um, in terms of, yeah, I, unfortunately, I would get one that, if he can find a used gas mower that he can trade in when we get ours into the exchange program, that would be ideal. It's a little facetious, but um, I think, like everything else, if you think you're going to keep it for a long time, keep it in good running order, spend a little more money, get something that's good quality. The gas mower that I have is that green one, uh, and I'm trying to wean myself from it completely, and uh, we're, we're pr pretty close to being there. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Craig. We appreciate the, uh, the good work on the project and your presentation here today. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I appreciate the support.